tactics and strategy. These words are often used interchangeably to mean the methods through which wars are fought. They are used as mere synonyms, different words with the same meaning. That would be wrong. While tactics and strategy are both concerned with the planning of military actions, they are separated by the skill they apply to. They are so-called levels of war. While levels of war may at times overlap, they must never be used interchangeably. Distinguishing tactics from strategy isn't a matter of pedantic terminology. These are important theoretical constructs on which a common understanding of war is built. They form part of the language of military history. This episode of the Military History Handbook will explore the levels of war and in doing so, explain the difference between tactics and strategy. Starting with the three major levels of war, we have tactics and strategy at either end of the scale. Tactics is the smallest level and it concerns itself with winning a battle. The skill can be anywhere between a 10-man squad defending a trench up to a division of over 10,000 men attacking a hill. The tactical level is the sharp end of war, where men and machines clash. The way they fight and the equipment and organization they use are all part of the tactical level. The tactical level produces winners and losers. A battle is lost or won, units suffer casualties and ground is gained or lost. Yet the war goes on. Success at the tactical level means winning battles, even against great odds but it does not decide the outcome of the war. Strategy, on the other hand, is the highest level of war. Strategy is concerned with winning the war, not just the battle. The skill of strategy encompasses the entire nation, its alliances, population and economy. Strategy is formulated by statesmen and the highest military commanders. Strategy governs major military decisions like opening new fronts or prioritizing the navy over the army. It also includes political decisions that influence the war, such as industrial planning and conscription laws. Strategy encompasses the entire military, the army, navy and air force, as well as the war industry, procurement and logistics. Strategy thinks in terms of continents and theaters of war, not hills and squads. To speak of a strategic hill is therefore wrong. No hill is important enough to become a strategic objective. This leaves a large gap between tactics and strategy. If tactics are about winning battles and strategy is about winning the war, then how can we turn winning battles into winning the war? The crucial bridge connecting tactics with strategy is the operational level. This is the third major level of war and sits between tactics and strategy. Operations are the realm of generals and large formations. Corps, armies and army groups involving tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands or even millions of men. They are often joint efforts with Army, Navy and Air Force each playing their part. Logistics play a major part in operations, often dictating the launch, pace and reach of an operation. What an operation aims to do is turn tactical success into strategic success. Achieving tactical victories on their own does little to influence the outcome of the war. But stringing these tactical victories together at the right time and the right place as an operation can have a great strategic effect. A key word for the operational level is decisive. For a military action to be decisive requires it to influence the war at the strategic level. Tactical battles are rarely decisive, but operations can be. Examples of decisive operations are the destruction of a large enemy force or the seizure of key territory, such as an industrial area. To complete such an objective requires tactical victories, such as breaking through an enemy defensive zone, capturing a key bridge intact or defending against an enemy counterattack. But all these little tactical actions must serve the larger operational objective. This operational objective, in turn, must serve a strategic objective for it to be decisive. Operations are massive investments of time and resources. The numbers involved can be vast, ranging from tens of thousands to millions of men, and the build-up can take months, if not years. Failing an operation or launching one that is strategically indecisive can lose the war. For example, an operation that successfully destroys an enemy army is indecisive on the strategic level if the enemy can replace his losses while you can't. Or an operation that successfully seizes key territory can be a strategic dead end if this territory cannot be defended long term. So those are the big three levels of war. The tactical, operational and strategic. Strategy decides the goals makes available the means and sets out a general approach. Operations then take concrete military steps to achieve these goals with the means available. And finally, the tactics enforce these plans on the enemy through armed confrontation.
Those big three are the necessary foundation. They are the commonly agreed upon levels of war. But it doesn't have to end there. There are a few more minor layers that we can explore. Keep in mind that these are less widely recognized than the former three and open to debate. Firstly, there is the technical level, which sits below the tactical level. The technical level is concerned with the capabilities of military hardware. Things like the effective range of an artillery piece, the fuel consumption of a vehicle, or the bomb load of an airplane are all examples of the technical level. Improvements at the technical level can be incremental, such as having a slightly faster tank, or revolutionary, such as having jet fighters in the age of propeller-driven aircraft. Technical capabilities influence the tactics with which the hardware is used, and can even dictate operational use. The reverse is also true. Strategy can influence the type of hardware a military adopts. A nation with overseas ambitions will be more interested in its navy and equipment that can be shipped and maintained across continents, while a landlocked nation with a defensive posture will likely invest in fortifications instead. The next level is reached by splitting the tactical level into minor and major tactics. Minor tactics is the level at which the smallest units fight. They often take the form of standard operating procedures or techniques that are taught through repeated drilling. Fighter planes flying in V-formation, an infantry platoon reacting to contact, or an artillery unit firing a counter-battery mission are all examples of minor tactics. Minor tactics can be seen as a bridge between the technical and tactical levels by dictating the tactical use of technical assets. Major tactics, on the other hand, is the realm of larger tactical units, such as brigades and divisions that are fighting within an operational framework. Major tactics follow general principles, such as achieving surprise and employing combined arms, but they are not rigid techniques or procedures. They can vary greatly depending on the forces available, the train and the skill of the commander. Next, between the operational and strategic level, there is the campaign. A campaign is a series of operations connected in time and place, serving the same strategic goal. A campaign might last months and encompass multiple land, sea and air operations within a region. Lastly, the strategic level can be split into military strategic and political strategic. Military strategy is about winning the war with the military means available. This is the realm of the highest military commanders, who translate the nation's political goals into military action. When and where to launch an invasion is an example of military strategy, but also things like procurement, such as whether to build battleships or aircraft carriers with the available budget. Political strategy is also called ground strategy and concerns itself with the long-term goals of the nation, why the war is fought and what can be gained from it. Political strategy encompasses high-level political decision-making that mobilizes the nation's resources for the war effort. Military alliances, industrial planning, and conscription laws are part of this realm. In a more practical sense, political strategy can be seen as setting the goals and making available the means for the military strategy. All these different levels are best illustrated using an example. Let's take the Allied invasion of Normandy in 1944. Starting at the top, an example of the political strategic level is the Tehran Conference of late 1943. Here, the major Allied powers agreed that a second front would be opened against Germany in the West to alleviate pressure from the Soviet Union in the East. An example of the military strategic level is the indirect approach the Western Allies took to Fortress Europe. Instead of confronting a strong Germany on the European mainland at the earliest opportunity, the Allies applied pressure on the periphery first. German forces were defeated in North Africa, followed by the invasion and capitulation of Germany's ally Italy. All the while, Allied navies had been tackling the German submarine threat, and Allied air forces had been grinding down the German Luftwaffe through factory bombings and air combat. When the invasion finally came in June 1944, the Allied military strategy had cleared the seas, cleared the skies, occupied German forces in Italy and strung them out along the Atlantic Hall, not to mention the enormous German commitment on the Eastern Front. The next level is the Normandy Campaign. This included all air, land and sea operations conducted with the strategic goal of establishing a lodgement on the European mainland, to facilitate a further advance into Germany. The Normandy Campaign lasted nearly three months from the initial landings on June 6th to the crossing of the Seine River in late August. 
An example of the operational level is Operation Neptune, the landings on the 6th of June with the goal of establishing the initial beachhead on the Normandy coast. This operation included coordinated beach landings by multiple divisions supported by naval bombardment. Airborne landings, airstrikes and sabotage by the French resistance to cut off German reinforcements, deception measures to mask the true extent of the invasion, and a massive logistical effort to supply the invasion force. The landing by the US 1st Infantry Division on Omaha Beach is within the scope of major tactics. Dividing units into assault waves, assigning them sectors of beach, setting phase lines with timetables and coordinating fire support with naval and air assets are all in the realm of major tactics. Minor tactics are the domain of the small units that fought their way off the beach. Junior officers rallying men into small combat groups, suppressing enemy positions, blowing gaps in barbed wire and clearing bunkers are all examples of minor tactics. Finally, an example of the technical level is the use of duplex drive tanks during the beach landing. This was a technical innovation that allowed a tank to swim to shore using a flotation device. As a conclusion to this episode, I want to encourage the creative use of the levels of war. This is a theoretical concept after all. It serves to deepen our understanding of war, not cage it into strict definitions. To illustrate this closing remark, take the following picture. It's an M4 Sherman tank, an American icon of the Second World War. The first level that springs to mind with a picture like this is the technical. We are looking at military hardware here, so specifications like armor thickness, gun caliber and top speed are relevant. Yet it's the rest of the picture that tells of a different level of war. Slogans in Cyrillic writing now cover the side of the tank, and the crew are dressed in Red Army uniforms. With this observation, we have made a leap from the smallest level, the technical, to the largest, the political strategic. What we see here is alliance politics at work. American tanks shipped across the world to be used by Soviet crews against a common enemy. In one picture, we can see both the smallest level of war and the largest. While being mindful of the differences between levels, one should also try to translate between them. On the technical level, the Sherman was lightly armed and armored, yet also easy to produce, transport and maintain. These characteristics held it back at the tactical level, where it gained a poor reputation, but made it excel at the strategic level, where it equipped many American allies across the continents. Oftentimes, performance on one level is explained by looking at the levels above and below it.